Hello students, welcome to online class. This is Ms. Adana Ogunyo, agricultural science teacher. I hope you've been doing well and you've been staying safe at home and you've been reading your books as well. Very important. So before we start, I want you to try as much as possible, no matter the, uh, regardless of the fact that you are at home, you should try as much as possible not to be distracted when you are studying or when you are watching any of the videos that the teachers are saying to you. It's very important because you need to learn all that you need to learn you know why at home. So for agricultural science today, I'll be taking a topic in SS2, which is crop improvement. But quickly, before we go into the topic of today, I'll quickly do a revision of the one of last time, the last video that I made, which was on weeds. We talked about uh, weeds that there are plants growing where they are not wanted. So any plant that is going where it's not wanted is called the weed. I would say generally that they are nuisance in the farm. So they constitute nuisance in a farm and they, um, they can serve as a host or where diseases and pests of crops can stay. And so they cannot affect those diseases and, um, diseases and pests will now affect cultivated crop. I would say that they compete with cultivated crops for sunlight, nutrients, space, they, and they, yes, and space. So they, they, they compete with cultivated crops. So to avoid that, the farmer has to do all he can to get rid of weed in the farm. So he, that weed now causes the work of, work of the farmer to increase and he spends a lot of money in trying to control weed in the farm because the presence of weed will reduce the uh, yield of plants. And in that video, we talked about, in that last class, we talked about different weeds with their botanical names. And then we talked about weed dispersal, that's the agent of weeds, which are animals and man. Then we have uh, wind, we have water, and we have explosive mechanism. So we we'll talked about all of that in that last video. I hope you have copied your notes and you do the assignment that was given to you on that. So today, those, that topic was for week one and week two. So this video, we'll be talking about week three and week four video, and it's a broad topic which is on crop improvement. So we are going to look at that in this video. So what are we supposed, what are we going to achieve at the end of this lesson? So let's quickly look at our learning objective. So our learning objective are, one, at the end of the class, you should be able to define crop improvement, say the aims of crop improvement, number two, state and illustrate Medel's law, number four, or explain the various methods of crop improvement, stating the advantages and disadvantages. So these are the things you are supposed to learn at the end of this class. Let me go back to that. So we are supposed to learn, uh, we are supposed to be able to define crop improvement, state the aim of crop improvement, state and industrial methods, law, and explain the various methods method of crop improvement. Now, moving on, we go to the definition of crop improvement. So crop improvements can be defined as the art, science, and technology of improving the genetic makeup of crops in relation to their economic use for man. So when you talk about crop improvement, is all the practices that a farmer puts in place, or let's say a scientist put in place to improve crops so that it will have economic importance to man. So when we say crop improvement, it is the genetic alteration of crops to satisfy human need. Now, with the uh, rising population, there is high demand for food. To meet the demand for food, there is need for crops to be improved. There is need for things to be done so that crops can yield 
the maximum amount of food that is needed to sustain the economy. So that's what crop recruitment have to do. Those practices that a, a plant breeder or a scientist have to put in place to improve the overall output of crops in order to satisfy man's needs. Now, next thing we are going to look at is the aims of crop improvement. What are the aims of crop improvement? Now, here I said plant breeders try to substitute the undesirable characters in plants, the yes. desirable ones, so that higher yields with superior quality and quantity can be obtained. So, the aim is for the farmer or the plant breeder to remove every undesirable characters, everything that is not desirable in plant, replace it with desirable ones so that there will be higher yields with superior quality, that is the quality is superior than what you are starting with and the quantity that the amount is better. So that's one of the aims. Other aims of crop improvement is, for example, plant breeders want to remove toxic substances, that's what we are talking about undesirable character like toxic substances in plant like for example cassava have a poisonous substance in it cyanide so a plant breeder will want to get rid of such cyanide although it's not actually uh, very poisonous to man but its presence can have some effects so plant breeders will want to remove such uh, undesirable character in cassava Another example, there are some mushrooms that cannot be eaten because they are poisonous. So a plant breeder will want to remove those toxic substances in such a mushroom so that um, humans or uh, humans can actually consume such a mushroom. So that's the aim. Now, they want to uh, improve yield. They want to remove any undesirable character, like I talk about toxic substances, the, they want to make sure that the plant matures early. For example, if it takes some particular crops to mature in six months, they will want to reduce the maturity time to something like three or four months. They will want to, um, the aim is, another aim is that they want to uh, make sure that the harvesting quality of the crop is better. For example, when you are harvesting some crops, they, they can get destroyed in the process. So they want to improve it in such a way when you harvest them, it does not get affected. So those are the aims for them to remove every undesirable character in the plant and replace it with desirable character in order for them to get higher yields. That one is number one. The yield is important. And then the superiority of the new plant that is being brought in. That, one of the aims of crop improvement. Next for today, we are looking at some terminologies that we'll be using during this uh, uh, the process of treating this plant. Number one is genes. Number one is genes. Let me do this in a slideshow. So terminology, the first one is genes. So genes are respons responsible for the transfer of characters from parents to offspring. Now, that, that particular um, thing that is responsible for the transfer of character from a parent to an offspring is known as a gene. For example, some of us are dark in complexion because our parents are. In regards to crops, plants, uh, for example, some males, males are yellowish in color because from their parents, it is yellow. Why some are white? Because from their parents, the, uh, the uh, parent, uh, 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 parent plant was white. So that is that thing that is responsible for the transfer of that white color from the parent to the offspring is known as gene. Now, in biology or in agricultural science, they come in pairs, and each parent they come in pairs. You know, when uh, during reproduction, each uh, plant or organism contribute a pair, uh, they come in pair, then each parent will pass one, just one, so, so that means the female will give, bring one and the uh, male will bring one, so making that pair up, that is transfer 
to the parent. We will soon, that, we will soon see that shortly when we go on now. So we say they come in pair, and each parent passes along just one to make up the gene that the offspring has. That is gene we say that is responsible for the transfer of character from parent to offspring. Number two is traits. Traits or character are inheritable features. E.g., I talked about six color. A, a maze my a maze will be yellowish because from the parents uh, parents it got that yellow color then in, uh, so i said the inheritable feature e.g seed color plant height those are traits next one is gametes gametes are mature cell cells that take part in production in plants the male gamete is called colibri while the female is called ovum so uh, a mature cell cell is known as what is gamete. Next one, we'll talk about phenotype. Phenotype is the sum of all observable features. For example, you can describe a plant as, or let's say, a mango plant. This mango plant is, is sweet and it's, uh, it is greenish. Or you can say most uh, mango, uh, mango from this from this tree is always greenish. It does not show its ripeness outside the feature that you observed. Or you can say that um, uh, this particular uh, mango tree is very tall. It's a feature you have observed. So all the, some of all the observable features, those things that you can see with your eyes are known as phenotype. Then genotype, Genotype is the next one. It is the sum, sum total of the genes. Remember, we talked about genes. The sum total of the genes is known as genotype. Next, we look, look at dominant characters. That, these are traits expressed in, even in the presence of constructing character. Now, we will soon get to see some examples. Dominant character, those characters that even in the presence of a contracting uh, constructive character, it will, it will still show. For example, let, let me just give this example. For example, a plant might be tall physically, that is phenotype in its phenotypic, uh, phenotypic nature, it is tall. But if you look at the genotype, it has the trait of shortness or the character of shortness. But because tallness is dominant over shortness, it will be seen. Uh, as a seen phenotypically. So now, next thing we look at recessive character. Recessive characters are traits expressed only in the absence of a constructive character. So a plant will be short because there's absence of the tallness gene there. So if it's, you see a short plant because the plant has the uh, shortness gene only, because tallness is dominant over. So it will only appear because it's only shortness genes that are present in that particular uh, uh, plant as at that time. Don't worry, get to understand it better when we start seeing the example. Moving on, we talk about homozygous. Homozygous are similar genes for the same character. For example, you see capital letter T, T, T for tallness, then TT for shortness. Now, this is homozygous because they are similar gene. Remember, I said that gene come in pair. So you see here, you have TT, capital letter T for tallness, and small letter T, TT for shortness. Meaning that it's the same similar gene that is contributed for that particular one. Now, let's look at the next one here, heterozygous, which is pair of different genes contributing, controlling a constructing character, e.g. capital letter T and small letter T. What this means is that in a particular plant, one, uh, a gene that is controlling to, is present there. You have capital letter T and small letter T in, present in that particular plant. So that plant is said to be heterozygous. Why the one that has similar gene? Controlling that, that character is known as what? Homozygous. Next one, we look at Mendel's law. Now, Mendel was a scientist, Gregor Mendel, is re often regarded as the 
father of genetics because his work formed the foundation of scientific study of heredity. So he was a scientist that worked on, he, he wanted to know why, uh, why some plants, uh, when a plant is cultivated or a crop is cultivated, it eventually showed the character of its parent. He wanted to know what is responsible for it. And he carried out a lot of work in, in this aspect. So he was a monk who carried out several experiments using guided pin, which is Persium Salatium, to study how hereditary, how hereditary characters are transmitted from generation to generation. So he wanted to know that and he carried out uh, several um, experiments to try to study such. Now, first thing he did was, for, he, now the characters that he studied, he studied during his studies are seed shape. He found out that round seeds are dominant over wrinkled seeds. Uh, so wrinkled are recessive, seed color, for seed color, yellow are dominant, white, green are recessive. For shape of unripe pod, domin uh, the dominant character is inflated, white, recessive is constructed. Then on right point, on right point color, half green is, uh, is dominant over yellow. Flower position, Aza is dominant over terminal. Flower color, red is dominant over white. And then for height of plant, tallness is dominant over dual or shortness. So you see, like what we see, so a, a, a plant might possess the gene for round, uh, round uh, roundness and wrinkles, but that plant will only uh, show uh, the seed of that plant will be round because roundness is dominant over wrinkles. But if you have two of those genes being uh, wrinkles, so that's when you see that that plant seed is wrinkled. We, we understand it in a short way. So the, the first uh, thing that Media did is first law, he tried to stay the first law. First thing he did is that in his experiment, he crossed two different plants with constructive characters, such as he uh, crossed a top plant with a short plant, then something like yellow plant and a green plant. Now, if we go back to the next slide, or uh, the previous slide where we talked about, uh, the characters that uh, led the study. You see that seed, uh, seed shape or height now, the uh, tonus is dominant over dwarf color, and then for seed color, yellow is dominant over green. So let's go back to that we are talking about. So these are some characters that I try to uh, study. You have tallness, tall plant against um, short plant, and then yellow seed plant against now let's look at the result of this experiment. In the first one, you have now, I will explain several things with this uh, uh, image we have here. You have the top plants, and it's contributed contributed a pair of gene. I told you that gene comes with pair. Then the dwarf plants with small letter T. Now you see the gamma that we put each parent to produce. One or we uh, give out one of his gene. So the from the parent generation, you have T T and small letter T, capital letter T and small letter T. Then the gamut that we produce, you have capital letter T and small letter T. So that means for all the F1 generation, you have T capital letter T and small letter T. And when you look at that plant phenotypically. Looking at it physically, you see that all the plants are tall. Then you be like, "What? Well, we crossed this plant with a short plant. That's because tallness is dominant over shortness. Now, in the next generation, when you saw a uh, that means you pollinated the, uh, the, um, the seeds from that F1 generation. You didn't get another seed from anywhere else. You, allow them to self-pollinate. You see, each of the parents now produce, you see, the garment that is produced, you see, capital letter T, small letter T, for the other parents, capital letter T, and small letter T. Then, look at what we have for now. For the F2 generation, you have, uh, this is a homozygous, homozygous G, which is ca uh, capital letter T, T. Then you have 
Now, phenotypically, it is tall. Then, for this one, you have capital letter T and small letter T. Phenotypically, it is tall as well. You say, now, nah, this is heterozygous because it has two uh, different um, character control, uh, two constructing character, control, uh, two different genes, sorry, controlling a character. So that two different genes, you have T, capital letter T, and small letter T. Then the other plant, you have capital letter T, small letter T. Phenotypically, they are tall because tallness is dominant over shortness. Then you see small letter T for this one. Then this plant becomes, um, be, uh, becomes uh, a, will be seen as a short plant. So it means that in the F2 generation, the shortness gene was only able to appear in the F2 generation, but in the F1 generation, it did not appear because tallness is dominant over shortness. So you see that the ratio phenotypically, you have the ratio of three, uh, three to one, that means three tall plants and one short plant, that's the ratio. But in terms of genotype, you have homozygous, uh, one homozygous tall, 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 and one homozygous short, then two heterozygous uh, tall plants. Let's read it down. So you see that the genotype is not actually some, the gene, the property of the gene is not actually reflect, reflected in the, in the phenotype or in the things you can observe with your optical eye. Now let's take a second example. We have those. Now, this is a cross between a yellow and a green plant. Remember in the other slide, we said that yellow is dominant over green in terms of seed color. So now we are representing yellow with capital letter Y, two Y, capital letter Y, 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 capital letter, and green, we are representing it with capital letter, our small letter Y, Y, Y. So the garment of each of these plants produce uh, a garment, so you have capital letter Y as well. So in their genotype, all the phenotypically, all the plants will be yellow. Why in their genotype they are heterozygous, uh, yellow and green? Then in the F2 generation, was, when you self pollinate this uh, plant, you see in the F2 generation, you have each of them producing the gene, then you have three yellow phenotypically and one green in, in their phenotype. But in their genotype, you have two, you have two, uh, two um, heterozygous uh, yellow and green, then one homozygous yellow and one uh, uh, homozygous green. The phenotypically is three to one yellow and green. So you can see that now, that now led Melder to state its first law, which is also known as the law of segregation of genes. We say that, that genes are responsible for the development of individuals and they are independently transmitted from one generation to another without undergoing any alteration. So that gene might not appear in the first generation, but in the second generation, is there's a probability that it will appear. Are you getting it now? So it means that they, you cannot alter uh, the gene. So each uh, the genes are responsible for the character of individual and they are independently transmitted without any alteration from an external force. Now, next one is a medical second law of independent assortment. Now, Medal further carried that study with Garden Peace, where he now uh, crossed pairs of contracted character. For example, Randa records uh, seed shape with seed color. So it has two contracting, you have, he's looking at seed shape and seed color. So he crossed them together. Now, the, the result of his experiment was that, let's look at that. The result is that, now look at in this, uh, in this diagram we have, you see yellow is represented by two uh, capital letter Y, two capital letter Y, Y round is represented by 
capital letter R. Then green is represented by small letter Y and green code is represented by small letter R. So each of these plants will produce a garment. So if you look at the garment, you see uh, you have Y arrow, that's capital letters and the small letter. Now, if you study this, at the end of the day, you see that more of the plant, phenotypically, you see yellow round, three, nine are yellow round, three are green round, three are recode uh, yellow, and then just one is recode green for the F2 generation. In the F1 generation, phenotypically, you see all of them as yellow round. But the gene for recode and uh, recode and uh, and green is still there, which what we are seeing here is still there, but it's not showing because yellow and roundness is a dominant character over green and uh, green green and uh, green code. Hope we are getting this. So those are the character uh, the the things that uh, made their studies. Then now that led to his second law, which says that. The second law or the second law or the law of independent assortment says that each character behaves as a separate unit and is inherited independently of any other character. So uh, roundness is not dependent on yellow plants. So a yellow plant which is round, it means that that plant is yellow not because of roundness. Neither is a plant that is wrinkled green. Uh, uh, green because of that character wrinkle. So they are independent, they behave separately on their own. So that's why, in, let's go back to the next one. That's why you see such a plant, you have you have green round. So you, you can find a plant green round, although green is recessive and uh, uh, roundness is dominant. So there are two different characters but it can be seen in one. So roundness does not determine the way that uh, uh, recode will behave or um, the other way around. So I hope we are getting that. So these are the things that MEDES actually studied. Now, moving on for today, we are going to look at method, method of crop improvement. There are various methods that are used to improve crop. Remember, the, the plant uh, breeder is trying to improve crop to increase yields and substitute undesirable character for desirable ones. So he uses different methods which include introduction, selection, and breeding. Now, let's look at introduction. Now, introduction involves the importation of some variety of crop with desirable characters into areas where they have not existed before. So, a, a breeder will want to bring in a particular plant that had never existed in, a, uh, in another area. For example, um, apple, as we know it, is not a native of Nigeria. When I mean native, it's not a plant that was initially cultivated in plant, but because um, it's, an, it's a very interesting fruit, let me put this that was very interesting fruit. So there is need for it to be imported and different processes were put in place to cultivate it in Nigeria and over the years it, it has it started doing well gradually in Nigeria and it's been cultivated locally in Nigeria. That's an example. But initially apple was not a native of Nigeria. It was not native to Nigeria. There are other crops like that. Such crops, such method is known as introduction. So now I said that is the process of introducing plants from their growing locality into a new locality. Now, sometimes if the plants get adapted to that particular environment and it's doing well, so it will become a part of that um, particular region or that area. So that's what is known as introduction. Next, we look at selection. Now, selection has to do with artificial picking of crops. Uh, let me put this in a, in a slideshow. We have selection. Now, it involves artificial picking of crops with desirable character, which are most favored by the environment and used to in, in, 
increase productivity of crop. Now, what this means is that a group of plants, you have plants cultivated out of the many lots that are there. The most, the ones that have the most desirable character are selected from the, the from the lot. The one that, for example, the farmer is looking at the one with bigger seeds, the one that grows faster. He will select such seed from the whole lot of plant that is cultivated. That is known as selection. Now, next thing we look at, there are def different methods involved in selection. Number one is mass selection. Mass selection involves selecting crop with desirable character from a large group of crop in preference for those not possessing those character. So that is what we mean by mass selection. Next one, we have pure line selection. We involve selection of crop, only one crop plant with desirable character from a self-pollinated plant. That means you have a self-pollinated, a plant that you self-pollinated. So you just select only one plant with the best desirable character from that self pollinated crop. For example, when we are looking at lettuce um, table, maybe the farmer wanted to look at um, green, uh, yellow, I mean, green round. So it means that you select just those green land, uh, green round and concentrate on that character. Next one, you have. Uh, Another method of selection is feed, feed degree selection, which involves record keeping of the ancestry of cultivated variety of a plant. And so selection is based on the performance of the plant ancestor. That means they'll, in the farm, they'll keep record of how the parent of each plant is behaving. So when the plant is growing, they will not select it based on the performance of their ancestors, not based on what they themselves are doing. Then last, you have progeny selection, which is based on the performance of testing of crop offspring or descendants. So this one is based on the offspring they serve, what the offspring they serve do. So that is what we mean by selection, the different method. Then the next method we are looking at is hybridization, which is also known as breeding. Now, hybridization, hybridization means uh, is a method of crop improvement in which two different plant variety of this, uh, in which two different plant variety of the same species are cross pollinated to produce offspring which have inherited the qualities of the two parents. For example, a plant, let's say like mango, there are some mango that are very sweet, while some are not all that sweet. Um, there are some mango that they have this kerosene tape, but they are bigger in size, while other mangoes are sweet, but they are smaller in size. So the, 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 the plant breeder wants to get that character of bigness and sweetness. So you cross such plants, that's known as hybridization. So the types of hybridization means Inbreeding. Types of in, uh, hybridization include inbreeding, which is the pollination and fertilization of closely related varieties in order to retain certain desirable character. So, inbreeding meaning this plant of the same type. Now, next one is pure line involves continuous self pollination of a particular plant. So, it will give you a pure line. Next one is cross breeding. Crossbreeding involves pollination and fertilization of different species, breed or unrelated crop plants to produce offspring with superior average character than their parent. So it involves uh, crossing unrelated crops to produce offspring with superior average character than their parent. That's all what um, crop uh, improvement of the bat to improve the. Uh, behavior of the plant so that we can get the best out of the plant and then um, sustain the economy of man. So this is where I'm going to end the class for today, but I'll quickly do a recap. We talked about um, crop improvement that it is important for, uh, uh, for crops to be improved because to help to uh, meet the need of man, then we talk about um, some terminology like gene. Gene, is a, gene comes in pair, which controls the behavior or the character of plant. Then we talked about uh, 
garment, which is a mature sex plan. We talked about men's law. We men's try to study how plan behavior, how characters are transmitted from one parent to the other. So please try as much as much possible to look at this video carefully. If probably you watched it and you didn't understand, you can go back to it and play it once again. Then when you play it, I'm sure you get a better understanding. And if you still did not get any of that, uh, if there's still something you are finding difficult, please send a question. There's a link in your uh, in the school website where we have sent the note. So on that link, you can send your question across to me. Or you can call me on my phone number. My phone number is right there on the group WhatsApp that was created by the parent. So you see uh, that um, phone number and you can call me. I'll reach out to you once I get that um, message. Thank you very much and see you in next class and God bless you. I am Miss Adam Thank you very much.